this and uh, set window would be nice. Uh, okay, so uh, some questions before we start. Uh, do you need to submit week seven exercise before next Tuesday, aka the exam? Uh, yes. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you're taking the first exam, then uh, your score is taken into account in the morning of the ex exam. So, at eight o'clock at Tuesday, I'm taking out your results, and that's that's your score if for the first exam. Then if you want to take another exam, like a recent exam or something, then you can collect more points before that one. So then I check your score again, meaning that you can collect points between exams if you want to, if you need to, or, or something like that. So if you're, if you're taking the first exam, and I hope you all are, then uh, your, your score, uh, well, it's, uh, it's like 8 a.m. In exam morning. Sorry, I was <laughs> reading something at the same time. Uh, no, it's not an issue if not all exercises are solved. Twenty-five percent per round per part was the minimum, and then half of your points comes from those points, and half or half of your grade comes from those points, and half from the exam. So no, you don't need to solve all exercises, and actually you can get the best possible grade even without solving all exercises. But I hope you try to solve as many as possible. But if you're missing some, most of you are missing some anyway. And yeah, you can choose whether you want to take the first or second exam or, uh, and you can take first and second and then you can take any number of exercises and your the best result is that is what is counted. So uh, I hope you, hope you try the first one. Even if you feel that you're not ready, it's okay to try the first exam. Uh, and then, uh, if you don't succeed, then you can take the next one and and so on. So it doesn't really matter if you fail in one of the exams. There will be three anyway. And there's also an issue in the recipe search in, in part six. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm actually aware of that, but it's I hope we hope someone fixed it already, but it's possible it's not not fixed. So if it is, we will fix it anyway. I'm, I'm, and uh, you choose between different exams by just coming to exam. So you don't need to enroll into any of the exams. There will be instructions on how to do the exam in the, in the material page, like by the end of this week, actually. And then you can just start the exam and, and then follow the instructions. But anyway, let's, uh, let's talk more about the exam at the end of this lecture. I have, a <coughs> I have some other information about that as well. But there's some things we need to need to talk before the end of the lecture. Let's see this. Sensitive stuff. So no, I think now we're good to go. So this is the final part of introduction to programming. And then uh, we'll have a one week break next week, basically when you're having the exam. And then we will continue with the advanced programming course week after that one. And, and for the advanced programming course, we will have the lectures at Thursdays. I will, I will have the, the information will be in material and I will include it in the course page, but there will be no Tuesday lectures. Instead, we will have the lectures at Thursdays at 10.15. So again, we have two time slots reserved for that one. And we're going to use the latter one for, for the advanced course because I have another, another lecture at the same time. Tuesdays. Okay. Uh, anyway, for this uh, part seven, last week we talked about reading files and about uh, manipulating the data in files. And uh, what we learned, or hopefully learned, was that the reading reading the files is not difficult, but then uh, it's a, the handling the data in files that can be a bit more complicated. Like CSV files, we need to split the data and then convert all the data points into correct format and, and things like that. And also when we're writing files, writing text is, is quite simple, but if you have like a, a list of data, then again, you need to convert it into a string and, and things like that. And then we talked a little bit about validating inputs and then specifically about exceptions, about catching errors 
in programs. And so, and uh, for our final week of the introductory course, we're going to talk about modules. Uh, and these are like external libraries of code we can use. And, and we've been actually using models before uh, in a lot of occasions, for example, math to calculate the square root, or last week we used the OS module to delete files and, uh, and the things like that. And uh, let's start with something, something. Let's start with the, with the math module as an example. So before we can use an external module, we need to import it. And uh, we import it with, for example, like this. And this basically means that we have an, after this statement, we have an access to the math module. So we can use the operations in that module. Meaning that now if I want to calculate the square root of 16, for example, I can do type in math dot, oops, sorry, math dot, missing my, math.sqrt and then what was it 16 for example then when i executed it this place for 4.0 so basically after opening the access to that external module i can use any of the operations in there if i want to get the approximation of pi i can type something like math.pi and then this place three and then some decimals probably enough to for for most calculations anyway uh, so, before I can use the external library or the module, I need to import it with the import statement. And now there are several ways or several methods for importing these operations. I can do this basic import math, or I can say from math import and then list the operations I want to use, something like sqrt and cos and pi, for example. And after this one, I don't need to use the math prefix. I can just type something like pi in here, and then it displays the same same thing. Uh, so there's a difference between just importing math or stating that that import these specific operations from the math module. Now, which one you want to use? Uh, there are upsides and downsides for both of these. I hate this waiting room thing. Uh, so uh, when I do it like this, then I explicitly state that these are the operations I'm, I'm going to use from this one. So this is, uh, that's an upside for this one, but the downside for this one is that when I'm using one of these operations, it doesn't state that you can't see directly that this pi operation comes from math module, especially when you have a longer program and the input statement can be quite far away. So if you just import math like this and then use it like this, then it's more obvious in the program code that we're using the pi operation, in this case pi constant, which is from the math module. Uh, now, there are different coding conventions in diff different like contexts. Uh, a lot of companies, for example, have a coding convention where they want you to use this import math system all the time. So they don't allow you to say that from math import something. And then there are uh, some other other occasions which want you to state that from math import something. So, uh, and then when you're doing this yourself, then you can just decide which one you prefer. I think there, as I said, there are upsides and downsides for both of these. Uh, you can also do something like this use a wildcard, an asterisk, and after this one, you can use all the operations from the math module without specifying the module name. Uh, I want you to know that this is possible because this is sometimes something something you sometimes see in, in, in some examples, but please don't use this one because now you don't see the connection between this operation and the and this module here. So it's difficult to realize when you're reading the program code that is by pi constant or pi value comes from this math module. And uh, this is important because in, in, in programs, in longer programs, it's typical to have several imports in the, in the beginning of your program. And uh, it's important to know that when you're using an operation where it comes from, so you know that how it works. You can even, even have similarly named operations in different modules. 
So uh, it's, it's good to know what this means, but please don't do it. Instead, just specify the names or just say input math. OK, other than that, uh, uh, importing operations isn't that complicated. There are these two options which you need to choose from. Uh, and after you import something, let's just import math as whole. The to see what kind of operations are included in that module, where first of all, Google is your friend. So typing something like Python and math into Google probably gives you the link to the Python documentation, documentation as a first or, or uh, one of the first results. Uh, anyway, that's a good thing because it's, it's difficult to remember all of this. There's a question, uh, how would the program decide if you use operation with same name from many modules? Does it give an error? Uh, no, it doesn't. I think it uses the latest one imported as for that one. So because when you import something, you sort of create like an access to those modules, those operations. And then if you import several things and if they contain similarly named functions, or operations, then I think it's the final one that's used. But this is, I don't know if this is actually strongly defined in Python or, or this may this may vary, vary between different implementations of Python, but I think it, it, it works like that. Uh, what was I talking about? Yeah, about the contents of the, of the library or module. And in uh, Visual Studio Code, it, it's, it's quite easy to see what the library includes by just typing the name and then a dot, and then I get a list of all these operations in here, like by and log and seal and, and SQRT. What they actually do might be a bit more difficult. So the documentation is great for this. So you can actually see what the operations are. And there are usually there are some kind of coding examples included. But if you remember that there's a function you require, but just can't remember the name, then this might help. You can also get a list of containing all the operations with the dir uh function like this sorting for directory this gives you a list of all the operations in this library an actual list where the operations are strings uh, so it might not be as useful in your actual programs but it might be useful to find out what was the name of the operation you were looking for like how to get the 10 based logarithm so it must must be this log 10 or, or something like that Okay, then uh, let's see examples of some of the modules, some of the useful modules. So Python comes pre-packaged with a bunch of modules. There are hundreds at least. Uh, some of them are really useful. Some of them are probably not as useful to you, but uh, there are a lot of things which you don't need to implement yourself. The basic idea of programming is uh, also that if, if, if you have something that's already done, it's a good idea to use that one instead of trying to do it yourself. Uh, and the exception is, of course, that when you're, when you're learning new things, when you're learning programming, then it might be a good idea to try to implement something yourself because then you probably learn something. But even then, it might be when you're actually using it, it might be a good idea to use the existing implementation. Anyway, let's start looking at some of the useful modules. And the first one is ran random. So let's import that one. And uh, random is, as the name implies, used for generating random values. And uh, uh, now there are a couple of things to realize. Uh, first of all, uh, the random numbers generated by computers are pseudo something called pseudo random numbers they, they are they are not truly random numbers and the reason for reason for this is is that computers are fully predictable in a sense that that when we have a state in our computer we we, we always know what's the next state going to be unless the whole thing breaks down but uh, things going on inside your computer are, are fully predictable and, and randomness is not supposed to be predictable. Uh, so that's why we have something called pseudo random numbers. Anyway, they are random enough for almost all occasions. If you want to generate 
like truly random values with computers, then you usually need to use some kind of outside source or outside base for randomness, something like uh, background noise, for example, which varies usually in a sort of a random way or, or, or like uh, radiation, background radiation. Is, I, I, I've seen an implementation where background radiation was used because the background radiation varies also in seemingly random way. Uh, but uh, again, the pseudo random numbers generated by computers are random enough. Uh, again, a question is the Python random module based on a seed value decided by the memory ticks. Uh, I think the random module, it, it's based on a seed value. I don't remember what's the default seed value. You can set the seed value yourself. I think it might be the current time or something. But it can be memory ticks as well, but it's uh, something that that's not the same all the time. Time is actually quite sort of uh, also quite uh, quite often used as a seed. Anyway, let's see how this works. So uh, there are some useful operations in random module. Randint is one of them. And what it does, it returns a random value between uh, A and B as the, if you look at the, the description here, returns random integer in range A, B, including both endpoints. So for some reason now the both endpoints are included. So when you're generating a range, for example, or when you're taking a substring or something like that, uh, then the, you remember that the endpoint is not included. In this case, it is. So value is a random value between one and six. Let's see, when I execute a program, it's it's four, or if I execute it again, it's one. And we can try to execute it 10 times, for example. So we get a bunch of random values between one and six. So this is a one and six, for example, this is a, uh, something you want to do if you're implementing a computer game where you have a dice and dice well, like a normal, typical, most standard die has uh, values one to six in it. Uh, there are some requirements for pseudo random numbers or randomness for it to be sort of like random enough, as I mentioned before. And uh, one of these is, is, for example, that they are evenly divided. So if I get enough numbers, we get sort of similar amounts of. So if I if I do this like one million times, I get somewhat similar amounts of ones and twos and threes and fours and fives and six and so on. But that's all more about the mathematical part part of this one. So the randint is great. And uh, all what we use random typically for, I think computer games are, are like a typical way to use, use random, whether you're doing something really simple like a, like a card game or, or, a, or a Yahtzee or wherever, whatever, where you're using dice or, or something like that, then you usually want to come up with some random values. Uh, so randint is great if you just want to have an integer between two two values. Some other useful methods from random are, let's have a list, something like names, John and Jane and Paul and Mary and can't come up with any names, Dan and Lisa, for example. Uh, if I have a list of something, Oh, Bob, Bob would have been, let's add Bob because that was the audience favorite. Uh, so a list of something can be shuffled in the random order by some a method called shuffle. So I can say something like random shuffle and then provide the names list. And now if we output the names list, see that the order has changed into Mary, John, Jane and so on. So. This, something like this would, would be really useful if you, for example, implementing a card game, like a something. And uh, if you're doing a card game in, in the computer, I think a good idea would be something like, have like a individual card or card list, could be a, probably a list. And then you can have a tuple where you have like spades and one and hearts and, four and whatever. So you have a tuple where you have like the 
the value and the and the what do you call it? Come on. What is this spades and hearts and so on? Suit. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so spades and hearts and, and so, so suit and the number of cards. And then, then if you want to shuffle the deck of cards, then you just shuffle the list, list of containing all the all the tuples in it. Uh, another useful, yet another useful method is uh, is to sample. So let's say that I want to have a group of three people from this list of names. So I can do, do it by getting a random sample from it. So it just picks three names from the list. And the, and the thing about sample is that in in the uh, in the sample, in the list, it provides or returns all the items are unique, meaning that the same person can't be or can't. Well, same person can't be in a group two times. That also means that if I have uh, the seven names in the list names, then I can't can't get a sample of ten people, for example, from that one. So error, it's value error sample larger than population, or is is negative. But again, this is useful because again, there are a lot of occasions where you have a list something, a list of something, and then you want to get a like random sub list of that one. You could also, of course, shuffle the list and then take a, a sub list, but then that might be seen as a side effect. Uh, okay, then let's move on. Some other useful libraries or, or modules. And the next one I want to talk about is uh, is called date time, and what it what's what it's used is for handling dates and times. And uh, again, uh, handling times and dates is uh, when you're doing that, it's important, or at least a very good idea to use an external module for that one because it it may appear to be simple. It may appear be, may appear to be something something sort of a simple but there are a lot of a lot of things you need to take into account something like there are different amount of of days in some some months there are less days in february than in the other month for example and then there are things like leap years and even leap seconds which make handling dates quite complicated uh, so let's see how this works. So we import the date time, and actually for this one, I'm going to say that from date time import date time because uh, date time is the name of the module, and then date time is the name of the object or class we're going to use to come up with new date time objects. And a simple way to use this one is, for example, state that let's create a variable called now, and let's say date time dot now. And now we have a new date object which uh, references the current time, the time of the execution of this program. So when output now it displays it's 2021, the month is 10th, it's 19th day, and then the time is 12, 14, 40, and then there are some milli or microseconds or whatever, whatever they are at the end. Uh, so <sighs> This creates like a date with the current time. We can also specify a date and a time if we want to. Let's say that, uh, what would be a good same, good day. Say that new year is uh, date time and then it's 2021, date is 12th and the 31st day. If we output that, then we see that we have a date object. Now the time is, uh, we didn't set the time. So it's all zeros. If you want, we can set the time as well, like 15, 30, something. So uh, whatever we want. So this, how you use it sort of depends on what you're actually modeling or what you're using it for, whether you're interested in dates only or whether you want to use the times as well, or whether you're interested in times only or something like that. Let's anyway, let's have a have a date. And now uh, in Python, handling these dates or date times, this object is quite simple. So we can do something like uh, we can compare this. We can say that if 
new year is larger than now. See, it, it isn't new year yet. So that's true. So basically comparing two daytime objects uh, means we are comparing them so that the, uh, the later time is considered to be the bigger one. So because New Year's is bigger than now, it means that we haven't reached the New Year yet. Or we can say that New Year is smaller than now. So New Year has gone already or something. Uh, there's a question. So the date time used for New Year is the method and the date time for now is, is the module. Uh, they are, uh, yeah, 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 they are. They are a bit complicated. They are actually, date time is uh, something called a class, which we're going to discuss in the, in the next course uh, in detail. So basically it's a class that provides several operations and you can also create new objects out of the class like this. So these are just alternative ways to create a new date time object. You can just provide the values yourself or you can use the now method for the date time. So yeah, basically, so this now here is a method from this date time class and this here is a, something called a constructor which we call to create a new date time object. But as I mentioned, this is something I'm going to talk in detail in the next course. Okay, so comparing dates is easy, or dates and times is easy this way. We can also do something like this days to new or time to new year. Again, this is a variable, and let's uh, new years, new year minus now. So we basically now have a something called a time delta object, which contains the time between these two date times. So if we extract days from this one, we can see that there are exactly 72 days until New Year right now. If you want to be more specific, we can say that there are sorry, exactly uh, no, come on, exactly 40,514 seconds until New Year right now or new year's eve basically right now uh, so uh, again this is rather simple so you can subtract a date from another date and then you have a time delta object and then you can get the days or seconds from that one quite easily if we import the time delta class like this then we can also do something Get rid of the new year. Let's say that seven days. Let's create a new time delta. Again, there are, I'm I'm going going quite fast with this. So when you when you do this yourself in the one of two exercises, it gets a lot easier. Days equals seven, for example, and then we can say that now time in seven days is now plus seven days and then we can see what date will be in seven after seven days it will be 26th of uh, November and then the same time than it is now so basically these are the operations you mostly use you need to be able to create daytime objects you need to be able to compare them and then you need to be able to roll them forward and backwards and that's easy by creating a, a time delta object like this so if we want to know what is the, what is the date in, in 100 days, after 100 days, it's, it's 27th of January and, and so on. And this takes account uh, of all the, all the like leap, leap years and, and things like that. And days equals several, this, this is actually, an, uh, that's a very, very good question. This one over here, this is, a, this is actually uh, an argument for the time delta sort of a function, like a constructor function, but we're going to talk about this at the end of this lecture. So it's a special, it's like setting a, a specific argument or specific parameter value in the, in the function. So that's an excellent question, but we're, we're going to talk about it a bit later. 
Okay, that's basically it about date times, I think. And, uh, oh yeah, one more thing about formatting times. So if you take a look at this one, let's, uh, let's have the now again. So outputting a date time object is, uh, is readable. I mean, you understand what it means, but it's not probably like the most convenient way to display the information, especially if you're only interested about dates or about times or something like that, then all this, including all the microseconds, this is some, something not so convenient. And uh, if you want to format it as an easier to read string, we can use the str of f time function and uh, it's sorted for string format time, I think at least, which might make it easier to remember. And uh, this uh, function receives a string as an argument, and into that string we can use these special control characters. Here are some examples here, there are a lot of other, others of this as well, meaning that if I just want to output the uh, day and month, do something like percent T, percent M, and maybe percent Y for, for year. And then when I execute this one, now I get uh, this 19th of 10, 20. It's like a Finnish way to display dates, or sort of European way to display dates, I think. Uh, so the basic idea is, this, is that there are these control characters, which uh, represent day and month and year and, and hours, hours and minutes and seconds. And there are also characters for like weekday and, and things like that. And uh, we can use this in a control string and then this information is provided. Maybe something like day is, and then that's included also in, in this one. So it's basically a bit like an F string, but there are these the specific uh, control characters which are replaced with the actual time from this time, uh, date time object here. So it's quite handy when you're actually outputting something, some information about the date time objects. Uh, then a couple of things, I'm not going to show you examples of these because these are, are actually quite, quite sort of simple to test yourself. Uh, we talked about reading the CSV files last time to comma separated value files. Well, the idea was that we can have more or several data points in each, each row, and then they are separated with uh, a delimiter, something like a comma or, or a semicolon or a space or, or tab or anything like that. Uh, and uh, we found out that uh, there are some steps required to take, but it's not too complicated. But anyway, it's, it's a bit of a hassle to split the data and then convert the data into correct format and, and things like that. Uh, there's a CSV module included in Python, which you can also use to do, do this one. If you take a look at this example here, this sort of resembles the, the examples we saw at last time. Uh, so we use the which statement again, we open the file just like we did that last time. And then in the for statement, we use the CSV reader like this CSV from CSV model, the reader. And then we, sorry, it doesn't some finish in here. Then we include the file in this case, and, and then we provide the delimiter character for this one. And then it uh, splits it into a, uh, a list automatically using that delimiter character. There are some upsides for using this one instead of doing it yourself. For example, if you have a case like this, let's say that this is your data. Uh, then uh, in this case, the CSV module understands that this uh, comma belongs to this string, so it shouldn't be splitted by this one. But if you just use split, then it's going to also split by this comma here. So it understands that if something is inside quotas, like in this case, then it shouldn't be split over there. It, uh, it also removes the line fields by itself, I think. I think actually I'm not 100% certain, but I think it removes the line feed at the end of the end of the line. So it sort of automates a lot of things for you. So when you're reading CSV files, especially if there's something more more 
more complicated, like uh, like a lot of text or something, then using the CSV model might be a good idea. It's good to know how to do it yourself. And I, I think you all do at this point, but it's also handy to be able to use something existing after you know how to perform it by yourself. Uh, then uh, we can also read a web page. Let's see how this goes. Neuralib request. Uh, let's try some. Let's we can, we can have the same. Well, let's have the Helsinki.fi over there. Then we can read the data from the website by using the read method, and that all it takes to read the content of a web address. Now, when I output it, we get a bunch of code. We actually, this is an HTML code, and there's a, there's a lot of JavaScript actually included in this one. This is basically what your browser gets when you open a, uh, an address like Helsinki.fi, and but then your browser knows how to pass this in a, in a format which is readable by users. That's not JSON, no, it's, a, it's HTML actually. Uh, it's also possible to read JSON objects with uh, with uh, Python. There's JSON code library as well. Didn't include it in these slides, for, but I did think, think there's uh, there's an example about reading JSON in the in the material. Anyway, it's an HTML page, and then if you can, you can read any data again again with this one. Uh, so really something like this might not be as useful, but there are a lot of resources on the internet which are, 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 are like text only. So it uh, could be, there are a lot of like open data sets and things you might be interested in, and like statistics and, and things like that. So instead of downloading everything in your computer, it might be possible to just write a program that reads the data directly from an internet address and then does something with the data. And uh, for example, you might be working in a, in a group or something where you share the data. It was said data is shared in a in a server, something over internet. And so it's rather easy with Python to just read the whole whole given resource by using. And if you take it, it's just like two lines of code basically to read read the resource over internet. Uh, again, I think this is a good example of something that. Uh, you need it's it's a good thing that you know that this can be done with Python. And it's a good thing that you know that it's it's quite simple with Python. It's a lot more complicated with some other languages, but it's definitely not something you need to remember, like what was the actual library and how to perform it, because you can find this kind of example again with Google. Really, like it's really simple. So it's something like Python and read web page or, or something. Uh, so I, for example, I can't remember the exact library and, and the exact exact method if I haven't used it in a while. Because there's no point in in remembering all these all these kind of things. They are so easy to find out. It's a good thing to know that what can be done, or good thing to have some kind of knowledge that this thing can be done. But uh, then finding out or rem reminding yourself how it was done, it's usually easiest to just Google it or or look at the documentation or or anything like that. Anyway, this is definitely useful in some occasions. Okay. And uh, now, uh, if we talk about modules in Python, all the modules in Python are actually just programs. And let's have an example about this one. Let's uh, create a new file called calculator.py. This is going to be a really simple one. And let's have some functions in here. Add, which gets two numbers like A and B. Then it returns the sum of A and B. So it's not going to be as useful, but it's an example. Then let's have a subtract A and B again, and then it returns A minus B, and maybe one more like a product A and B, and then it returns A times B. 
could be actually multiplied probably. It's a better name. So, uh, and now if I want to use this as a module, this is all I need to do. So it's actually complete a complete module. So I execute it on this and uh, it doesn't seem to be doing anything and it doesn't need to. So if I execute it, nothing seems to happen. Now let's get back to our other program, this example. And now if I want to use those functions defined in calculator, all I need to do is state that import and calculator like this. And now I have access to all the functions defined in this calculator Python program. So I can say something like calculator dot add, and then let's see 44 plus 55. And then when I execute this one, then it displays 99. And I can, or I can say that from calculator import, was no division in import multiply, for example, and then I can just type multiply and uh, 100 and 100, for example, and, and then I can use that, that operation from the other file. Uh, so why is this useful? What do you think? Or let me rephrase that. Uh, yeah, definitely very, very, very good answer. You can build large programs with it, definitely. Uh, there's also a question, what if your file is in another directory, then it's not going to work. So your import files need to be either in the same directory or, or in the specific directory specified in Python's uh, configuration about where Python searches for external modules. So you can't specify a directory or a folder here when you, when you import something. Uh, but yeah, building lots of programs is, uh, is really uh, a useful feature and uh, especially reusing code, meaning that when you reach in some code but that might be useful in other programs as well, you don't need to rewrite it or you don't need to copy and paste it. Uh, Instead, you can just import something some, from somewhere. And then really good point, you can also abstract, abstract the details away, which is also great. So I'm just saying that, uh, say that I'm saying import calculator. And in this occasion, it might not be really that important on how the calculator was actually, was actually implemented. I'm just saying that I want to use calculator and then the calculator is actually implemented in another file. But in this program, it's not important. It just states that I want to use the operations in there. Uh, and as I said, it makes reusing the code easy. You can use the same code in a lot of different programs. Uh, and now something you've been asking, I remember that you've been asking this before. And uh, let's get back to calculator. So let's say that we are writing this calculator. Well, let's, let's add something new like, uh, Divide is a useful operation for calculators, I think. And let's return a divided by d. And uh, let's see that we want to test it because we've learned that testing the programs is important. Uh, we don't know whether they work unless we test them properly. So let's, did, let's test the division, something like uh, divided 10 divided by two and then maybe divide something like, I don't know, eight by three or something. And then let's see what the, oh, there's a comma over there. And let's see what the program does. So it's, in, yeah, so five divided by two is 5.0 and eight divided by two is, is close enough to a lot of sixes and a five. So, okay, it seems to work. So this is fine. Then let's get back to this other program here. Uh, what will the program output when I execute this? Yeah, 10,000 is great. Let's execute it. And now it displays 5.0, 2 point, a lot of sixes and then 10,000. So what happened? Why? What went wrong? What's all this 
extra stuff in there. Okay, so yeah, there's a, there's a great task as well. The print statement was left, and this is exactly what happened. So let's, if I type in here that testing the calculate, can I spell it, it seems calculate, so operations like this, that was a difficult one. And this is what we're doing. And now when I get back to the where here where I import the calculator, it also outputs the testing the calculator operations and, and so on. So it means that just importing the calculator is enough to get those messages. <coughs> and actually, even just something like from calculator import add, even this one displays all these messages. And this probably isn't something we want. We want to have the calculator to functions. We want to have access to the functions, but we don't want to see all the testing. Then again, in calculator, it's a good. It, we, it's important that we are able to write this uh, testing code in here. We don't know that these actually work if we can't test them. And uh, yeah, we can try to remember to get rid of them, but we probably don't at all times. So what's the solution? Now we're going to need, need this sort of infamous if name equals main thing. Let's include all this code inside this block. Now let's execute the test code. Yeah, it seems to work testing the calculator operations. And now let's get back to this one. Let's use the add for something. And now when we execute this one, we only get the 40 in there. So now including this test code inside this if name equals main block means that uh, this code is only executed when I execute this exact, this exact program, this calculator program. But when I import this code somewhere else, then it's not executed. Why is that? It's because this name is a special kind of variable. I can actually show it to you. Let's, let's output the value of that variable. Oh, God, not like that, like this. So now when I execute the program in here, we can see that the value is, uh, is main, it's over there. And then when I get to another program, when I execute this, we can see the value is calculator. What it means is that this uh, name variable holds the name of the module, that or name of the program that uh, is using this current program at the moment. And the value of main means that we're using it from this. We just started that program as a standalone. If it's something else, then it means that another module or another program imports it as a module. So uh, when you're writing code, you're about to use somewhere else. When you're writing something and you think that, OK, this is definitely going to be useful in another program as well. I'm, I'm writing these functions, and, and these are definitely something I could use in a, in a different program. Then it's a good idea to include all your test code inside this if name equals main block. And actually including all your test code inside this is never a bad idea, unless there's some code that needs to be executed every time, even when this is imported. Uh, so there might be some like initial stuff you need to do whenever the, it's used. But uh, if there isn't, then using this if name equals main is a, is a good idea. I don't really like this syntax. I think this is overly complicated because this is a quite often needed operation. But it's just, it's in, well, it's, it, it is what it is. OK, anyway, this sort of solves our problem. Now we can, can import it, and it doesn't execute the code in here. It just provides the, this output in here. But when I execute the calculator, then it executes the code inside here. This is also the reason why you are using this, or why you ask to use this in some of the some of the exercises where you need to write functions. So if you want to test the functions, you can test them inside this if name equals my main and then the code when our, our test program uh, imports your solution. That's what we do most of the time. We import our we write test programs that import your solution and then we see what it does. Like then we test it with different call your functions with different values or or uh, 
provide different inputs from keyboard, like automatically to see that it outputs what it's supposed to output and things like that. So if you want to test them yourself, you can just include this in, 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 a, in a block like this, and then it's not executed when we, when we import it. Okay. Uh, then uh, we're going to conclude. There are a couple of sort of uh, like mixed things I wanted to talk about. Something that were not included in any of the previous things. Uh, the first one is this uh, sort of a conditional expression. So let's say that we let's query a value from user, something like number equals. And then uh, a typical, well, let's say, let's say that we are interested on in whether the number is larger than 100 or not. We could do something like it's larger or else print it isn't. So uh, this is something we can replace with a single expression in Python. We can state something like print. Uh, is larger if number is larger than 100 and else we output it isn't. So all this is now a single expression that gets uh, and the value of expression will be either is larger or it isn't. So one of these strings. So let's try this out. Let's give something like 105 and then we get the Oh no, it's is larger. So, so supposed to say larger instead. Let's get the same uh, output two times like this. So uh, I'm not saying that you need to use this. It's uh, it, again, it's handy if you want to have a single expression with two possible outcomes depending on on the values of some variables or, or something like whatever condition like in this case, but at least uh, at least uh, I want you to understand what happens here. Luckily, this is actually quite easy to read because it's like larger if number is larger than 100 and else it isn't. It's like this value, if this is true, and if it isn't, then this one. This one also, no, it doesn't, sorry. Yeah, it can't have none as a value. Sorry, I just... Yeah, that's a good question. This is a uh, similar to the, the ternary conditional condition in Java, where there is a question mark and then the colon separating. So yeah, it's exactly equivalent to that one. So if you're familiar with, with the syntax of, of Java, I don't know if that's in other, other languages, but at least in Java, there's a really similar kind of operator. Just the syntax is different. Okay, uh, some other useful techniques. Well, we talked about the pass keyword. I don't, I don't think we need to return to that one. So we know that we have a pass keyword that doesn't, or statement that doesn't really do anything, but it's useful because Python doesn't allow, allow us to have empty blocks. Uh, then about default parameter values, and this is something that we used, for example, when we created the time delta object, and then we have the days equals is equals something. This is related to that one. So let's have a function like greet, for example, the name, and now we provide the default value for parameter. So let's have a simple, simple function like this. And uh, now when we provide a default value for parameter, there are two ways to call this function. First one is that we don't provide any argument. So we use the default value. So now it outputs hello there, Paul Python. Or we can provide a value like this. And if I provide a value for this parameter, then this uh, value overrides the default value. So this is like the basic idea of default parameter values. 
if we don't provide any value, uh, then we use the default value. If we provide an argument value, then it overrides the default value. And uh, let's have another example. <coughs> so now we have uh, three parameters, and uh, there are default values for, for two of those. And let's just output. A simple f string like uh, day dot month dot and year. Oh, forgot to add those. And now I can provide values for all of this. I can just call the display dates with uh, twenty twenty five and eleven. And then it displays 11th of 5th, 2020. Or I can just provide the year. So it displays the New Year's Eve. So if, and uh, I can also provide, I, all, I need to provide a year each time. I can't, I can't call it with any values, any arguments, because the year doesn't have a default value. I need to provide a value for year. But let's say that I want to provide a value for day, but not for month. And in this case, uh, I need this operator, so I can do it. Year, day is 22, oops, year is not okay, 2020, something like this. So now I don't need, I need to, don't need to provide the value for month because it has a default value, but now I need to use this equals character so that because uh, now Python knows that I want, don't want to have 22 as an argument for month, but I want it to be argument for day. Now it displays 22nd of 12th, 2020. So this is the thing we were using with time delta and, and days equals something, something like that. Yeah, we can do that one. What will this output? No, it doesn't. It, it actually outputs something, something sort of it's not a syntax error or, or empty value, but what will it output? Yeah, so now it assumes that uh, we want to provide 22 as, as the month. So it just follows the order. The first one is for year, the second one is for month, and the third one is for, is it for day. Oh, no, oh, yeah, yeah, that was a great question. No, you can't have double commas. You can't leave empty, empty values in between. So you can't do this if you're saying it's a syntax error. That could have been, yeah, could have been a possible syntax, but but it was decided in in, uh, in some languages that actually I think it actually works. Okay, uh, any questions about this one? This is actually this is used quite heavily in in, in Python's own in in, in functions. So, uh, and this is useful in, in whenever you have something, something like this could be an example. Uh, let's say that we are, want to read lines from a file and then we provide the file name as a string. And then sometimes, and usually we want to get rid of line fields, but sometimes we don't. So let's have a parameter for that one and set it to be true as a default, I'm not going to implement this one and then uh, we can actually implement it. it doesn't take that many minutes so with open file name as file uh, going to need a list for line in content if in line feeds line Replace most my for some reason, and then uh, content is the append line, and then return content, something like this. Uh, so uh, now, when I want to read 
a bunch of lines, I can do something like this. Read lines and example.txt or something, whatever is the name of the file. And now, uh, now it removes the line feeds. And I don't need to provide the second document. And this is useful if most of the time when I'm reading the data, I don't want, uh, I want to remove the line feeds. But if occasionally, sometimes I want to keep the line feeds, for example, I'm writing the data back to the second file, then I can provide the value for the second document like this. And this is the basic idea of using those default values. When you most of the time have the same values for them, then you can provide them as default values. And then occasionally when you want to use different value, then you can just provide the values for those, those parameters as well. So it works with just by just providing a file name, or you can provide a second, second argument, which will then overwrite the default value of true for remove line base. So this could be like a real life example, I think. Okay. Was there something else? Oh yeah, finally, I think this is like the final thing uh, before some practical things. Uh, it's also possible to provide something like a changing number of parameters, sort of. Do something like this sum of values, then we have the values and we have a little asterisk, a little asterisk, standard size asterisk, but an asterisk before the name of, uh, of the parameter. Then I can just return the sum of values in this one. And uh, now how I use this one, I can provide any number of items. So this one works. Sum is 10, or I can just provide one and two. Uh, so it's three. Uh, it's a good question. It's values, it's not a list, it's a tuple in this case. So it's an immutable list basically. And it's a tuple because you can't change the list of parameters. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a tuple. So what this means is that we can we can write the same exact thing like this. Just provide need that it's a tuple, and then we just add extra set of parentheses when we're calling it. So this works similarly. So uh, I'd say that using this one is perfectly fine. It actually might be even even easier to read if you don't remember what the asterisk means. But again, this is an example of a case where you I want you to understand or know what it means because you may encounter this in some, some Python programs when you take a look at, look at examples in the internet and so on. So it's basically like a tuple. It's like a shortcut to say that, that this is receiving a tuple of values. And then it's a, and I, I can actually, if we output the type of values in here, it, uh, let's just call it without, like this, then it even outputs it's a class tuple. So it's just basically a tuple. It's like a shortcut of, of saying that it's a tuple of values. Okay, uh, then uh, any questions about the stuff we talked about today? So uh, modules was the main thing, and then there were some operations. Again, we went through this rather quickly, but, but these are the kind of things when you try them out yourself, once, once or twice, you will probably remember how to use them. Uh, and at least you know that you can use them and you can then Google for, for the stuff later. If you don't have any, anything to ask at this point, uh, then uh, we're going to have the exam next week, as mentioned before. Uh, we're going to talk about in a, talk about the exam in a minute, but after after the exam, a week after that, and we start at Thursday, as I mentioned, we need to change the change the date, and it will be in the material, and probably will remind you in Discord, and and I need to change the course page. So we start at Thursday at ten fifteen, and then uh, what we're going to talk about in the advanced course, where I think most of you will attend, hopefully, hopefully all of you. Uh, we talk a lot, lot about, lot about object-oriented programming. Uh, so we've been using 
a lot of objects and now we talk about how we can define our like, like our own objects or our own classes and create objects out of those so that will be basically like the main thing we spent if i remember correctly like first three weeks talking about those then we talk about functional programming things like list comprehension which we which was mentioned briefly but more about that and and lambda lambda statements and uh, uh lambda expression sorry and uh, and a lot of things some functional functions uh, and then uh, the final two weeks will be about programming games so we, we're using an ex external library called pygame to create like a graphical game like move, stuff moving around on screen and and then it's also example about how to use external external resources to extend the functionality of your python so whatever you want to do there's probably will be a library or for a lot of things you may want to do there will be an existing library you can use use available somewhere then about the exam uh, it will be for three hours if you have extra time allowed it will be one hour more it might also be four hours and five with extra time let's see we haven't decided yet fully yet anyway uh Extra time means that you have like an official statement declaring that you need extra time, which you will or need to submit me before the exam. Uh, the basic idea is that you can start anytime your exam anytime between 20, 10 and 22, but the exam ends at, at 22 exactly. So if you want to spend three hours doing the exam, you need to start at seven to latest or 19 o'clock to latest. Uh, there will be three to four coding tasks there probably won't be anything else so as long as you remember how to write code you probably will be fine the exercises are not going to be too difficult uh, i mean they are not going to be as difficult as the most difficult tasks have been during the course so uh nothing 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 probably nothing you can't handle and uh uh then the basic idea is that we have some automated tests for your solutions so we first execute those if you get full and these are similar to the tests we've been using during the course so if you get full points from those then you uh then you're fine if you don't then uh someone is going to take a look at your code manually and then you can get some points between zero and the maximum points depending on on how how close you are to the solution uh, you can't see the test results during the exam. The tests are, are performed after the exam has ended. So in the exam, you need to be able to test your code yourself. I mean, you can run it and, and, and use any debugging options you've been using before, but you can't see like the formal test, not like a test button like there is in, a, in a normal exercises. And uh, yes, you can use any solutions from, from homework exercises or, or something. You can't copy anything directly from internet or, or from any other student. That's what we are monitoring. So you can't, you can't do the solutions with anyone. If there are people who have the exact same solutions, then you're going to be failed. Uh, and uh, please, please don't try to find your answers directly anywhere from internet uh, as i said the the questions are not that difficult so uh, so the process is like that and then within four weeks you will get your results it will probably take close to four weeks because we have the finish six finish course exam at the same time and it's a really big one and there's a lot of people in these two courses combined like hundreds doing the exam at the same time so it takes takes a lot of time to assess them all Uh, so, yeah, that's a good question. No, you don't get the TMC errors. So you don't get an error in, during the exam where it says your output is like this, but it should be like that. And that those are the results of the automated tests. And those tests are not executed during the exam. Uh, so if you if you click the test button, then it, it either says that all the tests are passed or it says that there are no tests in this exercise but the tests don't work so you need to be able to test your program yourself so just take a read read the description really carefully see what it says about what your what your program is supposed to be doing and then try to test it uh, 
tested similarly to or with also all possible. And you can submit the answers by using the using the TMC submit button. So the the button you usually use to get the test results, you use that one to submit your answers, but you just don't get any test results. But but yeah, that's a good question. But uh, you get the detailed answers also in the in the exam instructions, which will be will be released this week. Any other questions about the exam or about the course or about anything? Because this is our. Uh, you can submit as many times as you want to. Uh, your final submission is the one that counts. You know, so normally it's your best submission. This time it's the final one. So if you submit the perfect answer and then, then miss something and, and, and resubmit, then you don't get full points. Uh, uh, you may get sample output with the question. Uh, with some of the questions or, or not, it depends on the actual questions. But there will be the instructions for writing the tasks are, are really quite similar to the ones you've been using, you've been having in the with the exercises. So doing the exam is exactly like doing the exercises, except that you don't see the test results immediately. Other than that, it's you're doing the exactly the same thing. Uh, also remember that uh, how it works uh, is that about, about the duration. So when you start the exam, you, we have a special system where you, you get the address address in the instructions where you go and then you log in with your TMC account. And then there's a start the exam button after you read, read the instructions. And then when you click that one, then the time starts rolling. And uh, when the time ends, it displays a notification that the time has ended. Uh, you can still submit in, in Visual Studio Code after the time has ended, but you're not supposed to. So if you if you submit after your time has ended, then that means that your exam is again failed. We can't prevent you from submitting in Visual Studio Code because it's open throughout the day, but, but we know when you started the exam and, and you will see when the exam time, time ends. And uh, it actually says that when the time ends, if you haven't submitted, submit again, and then you can do that, but then not after that one. Uh, so anything else? I think important thing here is not to worry about the exam, not too much. It's it's not going to be that difficult. If you're if you completed most of the exercises in the material, then you will be perfectly fine. It, it, it actually it won't be that difficult. I know it's a first, your first, and for some of you, it's a first exam at the university as well. So, uh, or at university level at least. Mm. The, the outcome of the course sort of depends on where you're doing this. So uh, you will get a grading if you're doing this in the open university or, or, or at the University of Helsinki. But if you just complete it, then you just get it. It's just that you complete it completed the MOOC. Uh, there will be the Discord area exactly. It's, uh, now if I remember correctly, we decided that it's open for asking for some technical questions for a little while, and then we close the Discord area during the exam so that you don't accidentally write anything over there. Uh, but there will be, you can test the exam before the exam starts, like in a previous day, to see that everything works technically. And then uh, after then, there will be at least for a couple of hours, there will be, you can ask some questions during that time. And uh, we will be available through email at least until five o'clock or something. Uh, you can't really ask about the questions uh, because part of doing the exam is to be able to understand the questions. We try to be as clear as possible to write them. I don't think you get, you'll get confused by the questions. We try to be as specific as possible. Anything else? I'm going to stop sharing now and I'm going to 
hit the record.